recording, we will get started here. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Kristen Parent and I'm the Program and Events Manager for the Middleton Chamber. We are excited today for our economic development session to feature um, Dane County Executive Joe Parisi. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors that even though we're holding these virtually, um, their support of the chamber and these programs help make that possible. So thank you to those listed here on the screen. A uh, couple housekeeping notes. So I know a lot of us have done Zoom in this new world we live in, but just a couple reminders. There is a gray bar down on the bottom. If you see a red slash of it, that means your microphone is on mute. And we would ask you to leave yourself on mute at this time. We'll open it up at the end for some questions. Um, but if you have questions during it, you feel free to use that chat and I will be monitoring, monitoring that for Joe and can ask those questions on your behalf. Um, also with your camera, uh, that works the same way. So if you see a red slash show it, your camera's off. If you'd like to take your, to, to view your camera, um, it does help with engagement so that we know we're talking to people and not just a computer screen. Uh, we found that some people with the AirPods buds in their ears um, have a little bit of audio troubles. So if that happens to you, you might wanna try to dial in a different way. And same thing with computer uh, quality. Sometimes if you can move closer to your router or shut some other devices off in your house that helps speed up your video. So like I said, we will be uh, utilizing the chat feature today. We did get some questions pre-submitted that Joe has, um, but really just looking for an update from him and hopefully, uh, we won't have any technical issues, but I don't expect that. So with that, Joe, I'd just love to turn it over to you and let you roll with it. Great, thanks, Kristen. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me in today. Um, I thought it'd be helpful before I get to the most current orders to maybe give a, a brief overview of the county's experience and a number of initiatives that we have launched in response um, to the pandemic. Um, I'm sure you've heard of a number of them, but I want to make sure to, that everyone um, has kind of that big picture so you know every, exactly what we've been up to. Uh, as you probably know, Dane County had one of the first cases in the nation of COVID-19 as far as a, a positive test result. We were the first in the state, we were the 12th in the country. The silver lining to that was that it did kick us into gear a lot earlier uh, than a lot of folks across the, the country. Um, as a matter of fact, we kicked into gear before anyone else in the state. We um, started issuing orders, uh, if you recall, initially restricting gatherings to 250 and then to 50, and then the statewide orders went into place. Um, our goal all along, and, and as with everyone else, we've been learning a lot as we go. Um, I don't think any of us ever expected to be caught in the middle of a pandemic and particularly be left somewhat on our own. Um, as we have been in this pandemic. We did what a lot of folks did in the very beginning operationally in Dane County government. We implemented our COOP planning, our continuity of operation plans. Um, most of those plans were developed um, by each of our county departments to look at how one would continue to provide services in the event of something like a fire or a blackout or flooding that, that, that made you have to leave your building, et cetera. Um, and so we initially had always looked at something that would be short term or for a few weeks. Um, little did we know that we would be looking at having to move for months. But having those coop plans in place um, really helped because we just had to tweak them a little bit. And very soon we had the vast majority of our employees working um, virtually uh, from home who could. As you know, we have a lot of folks who can't work from home. We have a nursing home, a jail, um, CPS workers, et cetera. And so we've done everything we can to protect those folks. We shut down our nursing home to visitors early on. The jail has a number of protocols and they decreased their population by you know, over a third um, by putting more people on supervision. And they've had um, a few outbreaks. They've had a total of 30 some cases, but that's been over the entire time. A couple of weeks ago, they tested the entire jail population, including all of the staff. And I believe they had a total of six positives and those have all been isolated. So they've been doing some, some, some really great work there. Um, we, we immediately um, activated our emergency operations center. That's the, the, the vehicle that we use to coordinate efforts with first responders, healthcare community, local municipalities, et cetera, and to share information um, regarding um, all of the response on all of, all of the levels. One of the things that we had to do in addition to kind of the normal, you know, looking at, at coop planning and, and activating the EOC 
was to quickly identify vulnerable populations. And one of the most vulnerable populations um, to, 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 to not only suffering the old consequences of COVID, but for um, a quick spread and a breakout was our homeless population. We have a women's shelter, a men's single men's shelter, family shelters for the evening. Then we have the Beacon Day Resource Center where a lot of people, hundreds of people congregate. So what we did um, is moved pretty quickly to move every family who was in the system um, into hotel rooms. And after that, we identified um, vulnerable people, um, people who are over a certain age and have medic underlying medical conditions and got them into hotels. And at this point, we have over 400 individuals um, in hotels. And this has allowed us to keep them safe and for us to get some good physical distancing um, in the remaining shelters. Um, and what we did next is we started looking at basic needs, right? There was, there was homelessness, um, then there's food security. Um, as you probably know, as of today, about 36,000 people in Dane County have had to apply for unemployment um, compensation. And people who were hungry before are even more hungry, and folks who never had to, to look for food at a food pantry are having to for the first time. So we looked at, 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 at being able to figuring out a way that we could both help the folks um, who are experiencing hunger um, and at the same time looking for how we could help our local farmers and growers because the irony is more people were hungry but farmers were dumping milk because of the supply chain disruptions and because of their, <clears throat> excuse me, their, a lot of their normal customers um, weren't buying products anymore. So we went to work on building a bridge to be able to connect locally grown meat, cheese and, and vegetables with the food pantry. And we, we contributed $3 million to Second Harvest um, food, uh, food Bank in, in a partnership with our local growers. And as of today, the, the, the food acquired through that program, about 95% of it has been through, from local producers. So that's been very successful. Again, that's a 3 million 90 day program. It'll probably end up getting extended, um, but we believe it's incredibly important. We can't let folks in our community um, go hungry. We also looked um, out at the small business community. Our small local businesses um, are suffering greatly. I don't have to tell anyone on this call that. And looked for ways that we could offer a lifeline to some of our local businesses. Um, initially, we found $800,000 um, in county money that we used to start a partnership with the organization Dane by Local um, in order to offer some grants to local businesses to help tide them over, certainly never um, intended to be the only source of funding that would save everyone, but we wanted to do what we could. And once federal dollars became available, um, we decided to utilize an additional 10 million of those dollars toward this program. And even that won't be enough to satisfy the need that's out there. There's probably at least $30 million in requests, but we wanna do what we can to do our part to throw a lifeline to, to these, our local businesses. Um, in addition to that, we, you know, another you know, set of local businesses we have are childcare providers. And we know and knew early on that as we're looking at, you know, this kind of the simultaneous triage, right? We're doing all of the emergency work up front, but at the same time looking at, at what we're going to need to have in place for recovery. And childcare is critical to that. So we recently announced a program um, through partnership with Community Coordinated Child Care where the county is going to pitch in three and a half million dollars in an initiative to um, award a grant to every single one of our licensed providers in Dane County. There are approximately 500 licensed childcare providers. And those grants will range um, from $1,400 to $15,000, depending on the size of the provider. And we, we came to those numbers by working with the childcare community to see what would be enough, but what would also allow us um, to be able to spread it out so that everyone could benefit. So um, we, we, we're hopeful that along with other assistance that that will help our um, childcare providers um, survive until we can begin to open up again, which hopefully will be soon. We do know that a national survey found that up to 50% of childcare centers could go out of business and we just can't let that happen here in Dane County. We've also beefed up our public health department. Uh, Dane, Madison Dane County Public Health, it's a joint public health um, department. That's why you see the mayor and my, the mayor Madison and myself um, appearing jointly a lot with our, with our public health director. Um, they have a roughly 150 employees. They have repurposed a number of them to deal with COVID. They, they currently have over 90 doing that. Um, but we wanted to beef up their operations even more. So we've allocated an additional $700,000 
for them to hire another eight employees that will help bolster their tracing efforts as we increase testing and, 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 and identify folks. And when we look at what we need to do to reopen, we have to be able to um, keep the tracing under control. And, and so we're having additional resources put um, into, into that, that kettle. Um, in addition to that, we have resources allocated to help people who have to quarantine, who might not have the ability to do so, who might need help with food, a place to stay, that kind of thing. Um, and so public health, again, is, is taking on even more. And I will say at this kind of juncture, it, it's our public health department is, is truly the finest in the, in the state. And the, the work they have done, the Herculean task, not only the past, over the past couple months, but continuing to today, they're literally working seven days a week and they have been for over two months. And they really deserve a lot of credit and, and a lot of gratitude for the work that they've done. Um, our work is guided by public health. We will continue, despite what happened at, on the state level, to, to, to work with public health and work with the business community and look at all the metrics necessary um, to guide our response. We, we firmly believe that in the long run, the best thing for our local economy is to do this right the first time. The last thing we need, and I believe it would be a disaster, is if we tried to open up too fast and we got a spike and our hospital system was overwhelmed and we had to shut things down again. Um, so we're committed to doing it right the first time. Um, in a minute, I'll get to kind of where we're at in that process. I just want to mention a couple of other initiatives that we have just to make sure people know about them. Um, on the day that the, the Forward Dane plan was announced, we announced another, another initiative um, that may have got lost in the news a little bit. It's a $10 million eviction prevention initiative. Um, you know, just like with food and other challenges people are having, we have, you know, thousands of people who are having challenges making their rent. That's, you know, a bad situation for the renter. It's a bad situation for the landlord because they don't have money coming in to pay their mortgages. Um, so we think it's critical to do everything we can to help renters stay in their homes, especially with the moratorium on evictions coming up soon. Um, so that $10 million will be administered by the Tenant Resource Center, and they will work with renters and landlords um, to identify renters who are in the rears, in their rears because of COVID-19 um, challenges. And we estimate that we'll be able to help about 9,000 renters. So we'll work with the renters, with the landlords, and get folks that money because we want to keep people in their homes. Obviously, the last thing we want for, to happen to anyone is for them to become homeless because of this. Another partner in this initiative is Catholic Charities, and Catholic Charities will be hiring four um, housing navigators. And these folks will work with people who are currently homeless, especially the folks who are in uh, the hotel rooms right now, who we put in hotel rooms, um, to help them connect with landlords and help them find housing. Um, one of the challenges, obviously, when you're looking for a new place um, and you finally find one, is coming up with a security deposit and first month's rent. So as part of this initiative, we've also allocated $245,000 um, as rental assistance to be used for folks who kind of need that upfront um, help, so getting their foot in the door. So we're simultaneously trying to keep work, do what we can to keep people in their apartments and then help folks who are homeless find apartments. As you may have seen, the Lion Energy Center has been repurposed um, for a number of different um, um, activities. Um, unfortunately, like many of your businesses, the Align Energy Center has basically shut down. And the Align Energy Center is an enterprise fund. Um, they, they support themselves. And so that's going to be a budgetary challenge for Dane County because of the number of shows um, that have and, and, and expositions that have had to cancel. But we want to repurpose it um, for now and do what we can for the community. One of the first things we did was we've um, worked in partnership with the Dane County's Farmers Market. And the farmer's market on the square for the summer is now moved to the Align Energy Center. And folks can um, get online at the farmer's market and order produce from their growers and then come by and have a box put in their cars uh, for them. Another thing that we've done is early on, the AC was identified as a potential location for a field hospital should we need one in Dane County. Uh, to date, people have done an amazing job under our Safer at Home guidelines and our local guidelines of staying at home and of being safe. The hospitals have done a fantastic job of basically emptying themselves out at a, at a great financial hit um, to them, I will say. They've made a, a great sacrifice um, for this. So at this point, we have not needed to stand up 
the field hospital. However, we have worked with, with the Guard and the Army Corps of Engineers um, to do the design and engineering work. So everything is, is, is loaded and ready to go should the need arise. And unfortunately, because of the manner in which the Safer at Home guidelines were, were struck down, rather than a dialing up, we basically had to throw the doors open and everyone pile into the little bar. Um, we're, we need to keep that space available as we monitor over the next few weeks the impacts of the orders around us going down. Um, one of the things that, that we're keenly aware of is even though we're doing our best in Dane County um, to, to, to be guided by, by, by healthcare and by guidelines and looking as we ratchet up at our hospital capacity, um, you know, when you look at UW hospitals and clinics, for example, it's not just the behavior of Dane County that impacts them, it's count communities around us, it's, it's, it's other states, they are a regional facility. So we have, to, we're, uh, we have to be very careful when we're looking at our hospital capacity because there's only so much um, that we do control there. Um, the latest initiative that hopefully you're aware of um, at the Alliant Energy Center is that we have a partnership with the National Guard um, to over the next 30 days um, have testing available. And I would encourage anyone um, and everyone to go down and get your free COVID-19 test. It's drive-through, it's very convenient. They're open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday from eight to four, and Tuesdays and Thursdays from eight until 8 p.m. Um, so it's a pretty convenient site. One of the things that we need to do and one of the, the areas we were lacking in when we're looking at the criteria that we need to meet um, to start opening up the economy is being able to do enough testing. As you know, testing has been very restricted. Um, but now with the testing that we're able to do at the Alliant Energy Center, it allows us to get a better picture of, of, of what the community looks like because folks who are symptomatic and asymptomatic can drive through um, and get tested. We also have other initiatives that we're building, particularly to go into some lower income communities that might not have transportation. Um, folks might not have transportation to get to the Alliant Energy Center to do some on-site testing across the county in different communities, um, and that will be critical. So again, anyone who, who would like to, or if you have employees or friends or family who would like to be tested, I'd, I'd strongly encourage you um, to go down and take advantage of that. So that brings us up to the Forward Dane Plan. The Forward Dane Plan um, is based um, to a great extent on, on, on a number of the criteria that the Badger Bounce Pack, is that what it was called, um, plan was. We have a, a couple of different you know, tweaks to it um, that our the, the health department felt were you know necessary to 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 quantify and qualify what's uniquely Dane County. But basically, they're looking at similar things. They're looking at hospital capacity. They're looking at a number of days um, without um, certain increases in, in in percentages of cases. We're looking at our ability to identify and trace every case. Um, and, and, and things like that. The, the, the link that should have been sent out to you has um, you know, more detailed explanation of that. The good news is that we are currently in what is we're calling the preparation stage, which you've probably heard, which allows non-essential businesses um, for people to go in and start getting ready um, for the ramp up to phase one, which you know, in general terms is a 25% is a occupancy of businesses um, with certain precautions put in place, physical distancing, um, Etc. So if all thing, if everything goes as planned and we can keep our numbers where they are, um, we're still shooting for May 26th as the date to open. Um, the, again, the, the one piece we're waiting for is, is to get in more of the testing now that we have the, the Alliant Energy Center testing available because that will give us um, a better indication of where COVID-19 actually is in the community. We do know that up until recently, we still had about 25% of the cases um, traced to, to community spread, meaning the people couldn't figure out um, where they got it. They weren't necessarily exposed to anyone we know. So it's important to remember that while we're all incredibly sick and tired of the conditions under which we've had to be living, and many people are you know, hurting very much economically, the virus is still alive and well. The virus is still spreading. It's still highly contagious. It's still extremely dangerous, especially to our elderly and the people with underlying medical conditions. And it has been extremely cruel to um, communities of color, particularly the African-American community. So the, the, the virus isn't going anywhere soon, but we are hopeful. We, we do think we've seen what well, we know. We've seen positive results from having the guidelines in place. And so it's our hope 
that come the May 26th, we'll be able to go to phase one. And the health department's plan is once we hit a phase, they want to be in each phase for at least two weeks because of the, the what we're all familiar with now is the lag time um, for infection um, to, to, to manifest itself um, in, in, in the population. So we can, because they'll continue to be tracking the numbers. And so if we can continue under phase one for a couple of weeks and everything's still under control, the system's not overwhelmed, we're not having a spike in cases, then we can move to phase two, et cetera. If we have setbacks, if we have challenges, what will most likely happen um, is we will stay in the phase we are at longer. Um, it's our goal and it has been from the, again, from the beginning um, to not have to go back. Um, and that's why we're being extremely deliberate and being guided by public health and the healthcare community um, regarding how we do open up. Um, because, it, it, you know, the, again, the worst case scenario is we open up and then we have to shut things down again. We don't want that to happen. And we want to provide as much certainty as possible to the business community and to the residents of, of, of the county um, regarding our plan. So again, the plan is out there. Um, you know, I know people have a lot of questions. A lot of specific questions can be answered by uh, Madison um, Dane County Public Health. Uh, there are a lot of questions out there. Um, again, they've been doing an amazing job. Um, they really deserve a lot of gratitude. I have no doubt that lives have been saved because of this effort and lives will be saved because of this effort. So we will continue to do what we're doing um, as far as the initiatives I announced and being able to drill down even deeper um, with some of the, the other initiatives we'll have coming forth in the coming weeks. So I think I could leave it at that. And if folks have any questions or other topics you'd like me to expand upon, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm happy to respond. And if I don't know the answers, we can follow up um, with you. Pretty, pretty sure. So I'll start with a couple of questions that were submitted to me. So one of the ones is that, you know, we live in a county which attracts people from other cities, states, and countries, some of which may have COVID hotspots. So even if we open slowly, and thank you for all your work that you're doing, how do we open safely knowing that other parts of the country are not being as diligent as we are right now? Yeah, that's one of our challenges. And frankly, it's other parts of, this, of the country, it's other parts of our state. And so that that's, you know, we can cry over spilt milk, but I can't change what other people are doing. Well, I think that the, the short answer to that is that again is why we're going to go so slowly um, with, with our phase reopening and are really gonna focus a lot on testing. We're gonna be going into um, long-term care facilities. We're gonna be going into the neighborhoods um, that I mentioned. We'll continue to ramp up. I know that schools, I know that the, the university is looking at you know it's some type of hybrid if they're able to open um, of opening very slowly and having you know reduced numbers. I don't want to spec speak for Becky Blank. It's just one of the scenarios, um, but their scenario would would include very robust testing and tracing. And again, that's where the public health infrastructure and the ability to test and trace comes in. Um, but you know the the person who's asking the question is right. There's no perfect system out there when you have. Um, kind of this patchwork of responses, but you know, we're gonna do our best. Perfect. The next question is, is there a plan to open senior living communities to visitors? We will probably see this as a last phase. Yeah, that's, uh, and I don't know specifically at what phase that comes in. I think that'll be very slow, but that's a question that we would be happy to um, check in with um, public health on and we could email you back a response be great. Um, my next question is kind of the, the declaration of the state of emergency that I think mm -hmm. was extended. Um, I yeah. think there might be some confusion about what, what that means as opposed to forward Dane. Can you just kind of clarify that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, so there was some understandable confusion about this. So we'll set forward Dane or safer at home aside for a moment. Um, a local declaration of emergency is a completely different order from the stay at home orders. Um, usually you see it invoked when there's flooding, when there's a natural disaster, a tornado. And really what the, the declaration of emergency does is it, it activates our emergency operations center. Um, and that's where we begin to coordinate with, with our community partners. Um, but, but most importantly, it makes us and communities like Middleton um, able to seek reimbursements from FEMA and other federal government programs 
um, for our expenses relating to whatever disaster we're responding to. So, you, you know, initially I, I issued the declaration of, of emergency and then I needed to extend it because it was running out. Um, but that was, that, that, that was just for this, this internal piece of our emergency response and everyone's ability to seek reimbursement for expenses. Perfect, thank you. Uh, my next question is, with a necessary and increased focus on COVID response, what are some examples of previously approved county projects that have been canceled, postponed, or reallocated? Yeah, so um, part of our response, our overall response, initially, um, you know, a couple of weeks into this, we knew that this was gonna hit us pretty hard, just like everyone else. So I've implemented a hiring freeze um, that's in place indefinitely. We also have a voluntary furlough program that we're looking at right now that we've implemented. Um, asking folks who would like time off without pay to step up. We're getting some good response to that. I mean, everything's still gonna be on the table come budget time. Um, one of the, the specific initiatives that we've had to put on hold, we did have a million dollar initiative um, under the, 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 uh, the, the, the CJ Tubbs Fund, um, which was going to be um, mental health grants for community-based organizations. And we just don't have the dollars right now. We work with the Tubbs family and the, 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 the community and they understand that we had to put that aside. Um, that said, there are other, are other initiatives that we continue to move forward with. And you know, just like any other business, local government, we have our pandemic response, but we have our other responsibilities. So there's another part of the Tubbs Fund, which is a mental health resource center um, that is going forward, kind of a one-stop shop um, for people to be able to call. This is a partnership with the county and all of our um, healthcare providers. And the, the mental health piece is going to be really important. And it's, it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot when we're looking at, at COVID. But, you know, a, a lot of people are hurting. This is, it creates anxiety, depression, whether it's because you've been, you know, isolated, you know, for, for months or it's because of the economic hardship you're facing. And I think it's really important that our community be open and talk about that and let people know that they're not alone if they're experiencing um, depression or anxiety or any mental health challenges because of this. It's a pretty normal response. And when you know, people care and you, don't, you, can, you can reach out and there is help for you. Um, so, so we're trying our best to keep most of that type of programming going. Um, we'll be announcing actually, Scott, I don't know if it's tomorrow or sometime this week, um, that our dredging pro, um, project that we have implemented to help um, improve the flow of water through the lakes um, is, 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 you know, in order to reduce flood risk, um, is moving ahead um, as planned. We're, our, the folks are out there unloading the, the equipment as we speak to begin the initial phase of, phase of dredging between Lakes Monona and Wabisa. If, if you recall, it was identified when we looked at the challenges we had um, due to the flooding a couple summers back um, one of the challenges was that we just can't move water through the chain of lakes fast enough because they're all connected, um, but the channels between them are, are all silted up. So we are going in over the next few years um, to remove the, that silt in the channel so we can move that water. And that's one of the examples of something that's, you know, remains a pressing issue um, in spite of the fact that we're dealing with COVID. The last thing we want to deal with is simultaneously is more flooding. So at this point, we're doing what we can um, to keep operations moving forward and continuing to examine the new initiatives that were supposed to come out in this year's budget. Um, you know, at the same time, to give you a kind of a, an idea of where we're at um, fiscally, $68 million of our, you know, 500 million plus operating budget um, come from uh, sales tax. And so we're not looking at 2021, we're looking at 2020 and wondering, you know, how we're going to make up for the 20 to $30 million hit that we're probably going to take, you know, just like other businesses are too. So, um, you know, looking at those new initiatives and hiring, et cetera, is, you know, just during this year, while, we're, while, we're, while we also need to be providing services and responses to COVID is very much part of what we're meeting about and dealing with every day. Touched on it a little bit, but our um, has the health department shared any trends that you're seeing in mental health issues within the county right now? We have seen um, some of the data we've seen has come from our EMS community when we look at um, the number of calls uh, for emergencies for mental health challenges, for drug overdoses, for alcohol 
abuse, and those calls are up. Um, and I think that's a sign that, that people are stressed, um, you know, especially if, if someone has substance abuse challenges you know, before COVID, um, this can only obviously you know, make it worse for a lot of people. So one of, the, one of the things that we've been trying to let people know about recently is the fact that we have a partnership. You know, we have a lot of mental health services, but one of the partnerships we have that's kind of unique um, to alcohol and drug abuse is a partnership with an organization called Safe Communities, um, through which we fund um, folks who we refer to as recovery coaches. And initially, recovery coaches were folks who focused specifically on opioid, opioid and heroin overdoses, and they would meet people in the emergency room and be there for them um, to, you know, to get them through that time, but then to get them connect with help afterwards. And what's unique about this program um, is, first of all, now it's not just for, for opioid you know, challenges, it's if you have an alcohol challenge or anything else. These folks are peer counselors. These are people who have been through their own personal challenges with substance abuse, and they've made it through to the other side. And you know, we know that you know, no matter what we're facing, what challenge in life, you know, it can be very helpful to be able to get some help from someone who really understands you um, on a gut level, who's been through what you've been through. So we continue to fund um, the, the, the Recovery Coach Program um, in partnership with some of our healthcare providers. And that's just another resource that's out there for people if it sounds like something that could help them or someone they know. Great. Uh, did the county already have a work from home contingency planned in place before the pandemic? And if so, what unforeseen circumstances have altered the plan and being implemented? Yeah, so, so we did to a certain extent. Um, you know, for example, we, we look at, um, you know, the 911 center or somewhere like that, um, that, you know, if, what happens if there's a blackout, where are you going to go? We do have a backup 911 center. And, and, and as we speak, we're actually, as part of our COVID response, have divided up our 911 responders to work from two different centers so we can keep people isolated from each other in case there is um, a blackout. So we did have a work from home as part of our, our COOP planning, um, but you know, we certainly never envisioned having to do a complete county government work from home. Um, so what was the second part of that question? Was there uh, a piece yep. I missed? And so, and if so, what unforeseen circumstances have altered from that plan? Yeah, I think that would probably be the fact that it is countywide and it's not just for a couple of days or a couple of weeks, that it's, it's for a very long time. And I know, and I know I, I'm sure we all have, have learned a lot um, about working remotely, both the, the benefits and, and the negative side um, of that. Perfect. Uh, can you talk a little bit? So the state um, state bird home order was overturned, the county put in place theirs, and how that the county order supersedes the state order, and if do cities have that same um, authority to make those kind of decisions? Yeah, those come through the public health department. So, you know, in Dane County, we have a joint city of Madison, as I mentioned, and, and countywide public health department. A lot of um, regions have city public health departments. So public health departments do have the ability to issue their, their own guidelines. It's under a different statute and they're, 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 they're structured a little differently. Um, but, you know, for example, Milwaukee is doing this right now too. Milwaukee had actually instituted their local um, order before the Supreme Court struck down the states. Um, there was, so, so in, in, in what we see is, you know, different, you know, regions doing it differently. But yeah, we have the authority to do that. But when I say we, it's the public health department who actually issues the order. Perfect. Um, so we have someone asking, I'm working with someone newly homeless. Would, who would I direct her to if she has two children under the age of five? Is there a certain department or Nonprofit. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and shoot me an email and we'll have someone reach out to you. It's parisi at countyofdane.com. Perfect. Um, next question. How are we preparing for another wave in the fall and what would you do differently if we are hit with COVID again? So our preparations for another um, wave in the fall have to do with, you know, again, beefing up our infrastructure, trying to get as much PPE as possible. Um, you know, working to keep the population, the, 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 the infected population down and to keep capacity in our hospitals. We'll have to continue to monitor that um, and continue to, to, to 
to work at, you know, kind of comes back to not opening too quickly, um, moving to the stages, but staying there and making sure we have everything under control before we move on. You know, what I think I would have done differently, and I, 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 I think as a nation, I wish we could have done differently, because sometimes it's a little hard to talk about this, you know, just regionally, but if I could control even the entire state. When we look around the, around the globe at the places who have been the most successful, um, they had very strong um, stay-at-home orders um, for a shorter period of time, basically. If you look at Taiwan, um, New Zealand, um, when New Zealand is, is the poster child right now for basically defeating COVID-19. Um, you know, I think if you can shut down early when you know it's coming and shut down very well for three weeks um, and then slowly loosen back up. And, you know, that's, I'm a lay person, right? I'm not a public health person. So that's just kind of my observation um, when I see. But you know, this was so new to all of us and none of us even knew what shelter at home really meant, especially for something like this. Um, you know, so I, I think if we could have been a little tighter with our guidelines, um, for, we probably could have gotten through this a little faster. But just a guess. Perfect. Those are the questions that have been submitted to me. If there's anybody else on the line that would like to take themselves off mute and ask a question, we would encourage you to do so. Oh, I did have one about New Zealand and Taiwan. Um, our islands, so access is controlled. Yeah. Would you advocate Dane County not allow anyone in? No, I don't think that's realistic um, right now. I, I, you know, I, th I think what, what I would advocate is for, you know, at least statewide, and maybe this is a pipe dream at this place, for, for us to not see people with whom we disagree as, as evil enemies rather than you know, instead, you know, get together and look at our differences and trying to figure out how we can work together. Um, because the folks who do the best at addressing these kinds of challenges are the folks who work together. And I will say one of the things um, kind of along the lines of the would do different that I think needs to happen once we're through this, I mean, we need to continue, you know, doing what we're doing now. But one of the things we've learned is that unfortunately, um, we can't depend on um, the federal government to take care of everything. So I think one of the things that's going to be important to do once we're on the other side of this, once, once we have a vaccine and people are, are safer again, is do a, a heavy debrief with all of our partners in the region and look at what we need to do to better prepare for the possibility that there could be another pandemic at some time. I mean, history has shown us that there have been and there will be pandemics. You know, things like stockpiling of PPE, and you know, in testing equipment, and at least knowing um, what we're going to do and what our plan is going to be, and relying as little as possible um, on folks far away, and relying as much as we can um, as, with folks as close as we can. Uh, hey, Joe and Kristen, yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. We can hear you. Uh, Joe Kurt Fassard, I um, I serve on the board of directors for Dane by Local, and I just want to revisit that issue. I think there are two very powerful things that you did um, with the initiative to put money into the small businesses in our community. You leveraged Dane by Local. You know that's the grassroots organization. They get it. They're in touch with the, the business owners across our community, and then putting the significant amount of dollars into our community. Uh, through those two initiatives was just great. So well done on both counts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one of the models that we used early on, realizing that we had a lot of work to do in a very little time, um, was looking at finding local partners who have expertise in the areas that we could um, that we could partner with to administer the actual programs. Um, the fact that Dane by Local is administering this program um, is 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 huge. Um, it's, it's, it's a piece of this that we don't have to be doing as we're working with everything else that, that we have to tackle on the county level. So that's why we've used that model also with 4C um, child care to have them, you know, administer the, the, the child care center grant. Um, it's how, why we did that with, with Second Harvest. Um, it's how we're working with our eviction prevention dollars with the Tenant Resource Center and Catholic Charities. And those kind of partnerships are really critical because as you said, there is a lot of expertise in this community. And when we can partner with government and the community 
and each do what we do best, uh, we can be incredibly efficient and get a lot more done. And one of the, the, the things that's really important, I think, when we're looking at how we invest the resources that are available to us in the county is to utilize partnerships with local businesses. That's why Dane by Local, that's why with Second Harvest, we didn't just say, here's $3 million, go buy a bunch of food. We said, we want to invest $3 million, but we want to build partnerships with local growers because, I mean, everyone on this meeting knows that, it, you know, you can get a lot more bang for the buck when you're investing locally because then those dollars recirculate locally. So I think that's really a key when it can be pulled off when we're looking at, at relief efforts and initiatives and dealing with something like this, um, the more we can source locally and work with our local business community, the better off we'll all be. Great. Joe, this is John Tweedale. Um, thanks for your presentation and for all the work you've done this last week. It's been a busy week, I know. Um, one, my question is, has there been any pressure to reopen any of the county-owned buildings? And if so, is, are there plans in place for how that might be done more safely? Yeah, you know, there hasn't been a lot of pressure at this point. I think, you know, most folks are, I, you know, and I can't speak for the courts. Um, they're kind of their own entity and they'll, you know, they, they, they shut down a lot of their things early on too. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure in some of the, the, the areas of the courts, there are some backups that are beginning to be challenges for people. Um, but, you know, you know, people for the most part, again, I think it comes back to the general, you know, attitude in Dane County, people get why we're doing this. And as long as we're still able to deliver the, the critical services at, at county government, um, people have been pretty understanding. So I really haven't had much, at least coming into my office, um, of people with, with concerns. I mean, you know, obviously, if, if folks out there do have concerns, please feel free to share them uh, with us. But at this point, I haven't heard a lot. Uh, we did get another question coming through chat for you. What is the county doing to limit the spread of COVID in the jail system? So uh, a few things. So toward the begin at the beginning of this, um, when the when the pandemic ha happened, the sheriff and the courts got together, and the a ADP, the average daily population of the jail, um, was usually 750 to 800 people. Um, they worked extensively to identify additional people they could move out under supervision and get through the system, and they got the population down to below 500. Um, so you know least 250 or more um, people not in, in jail who were a couple of months ago. Um, when you look at that, it's actually, you know, we're a community now, I think Dane County is about 550,000 that were fewer than 500 people in the county jail. And that includes Department of Corrections, probation and parole holds, and anyone who was in the system who was supposed to go to a Department of Corrections facility because DOC has said, no, we're not accepting anyone. Um, so they've done a pretty, they've done a good job of, of lowering that population. They've also done, and I, I apologize, I do so many meetings, I don't remember if I mentioned it on this one, but they have, entire, they have um, a couple weeks ago tested every single individual in the jail and every single staff person who, who works for the uh, sheriff's office. Um, you know, over the, over the period of a few months, they've had a total of 36 cases. I think they have six-ish in the jail right now. And so they isolate people, they keep people in pods in separate groups so that if there is um, an outbreak that, that it's, they can trace it back and it's, and it's localized. And they have some procedures in place regarding when people um, are first booked in. So, you know, I know the generally that's, that's how they're doing good. Um, the sheriff, you know, would likely have, you know, a lot more detail than I have at the top of my, tip of my tongue. Hi, this is um, Kate Wicker. I'm with the Middleton Chamber, and I just wanted to thank you very much for taking time to um, come and, and give us some information and answer um, our members and, and partners' questions. Um, earlier today, I was I was talking to a colleague and said, you know, this it's this it's uncertain, it's scary, it's frustrating, and um, after a list of about 15 adjectives, I finally just said, it's just all the words. So yeah. <laughs> um, we we appreciate. Um, you taking time out of your busy schedule to provide some some clarifications and answers to our questions. 
Happy to, it's my pleasure. So with that, uh, we'll hang out here for a few more minutes if anybody has any final questions, but I did just want to plug a couple upcoming um, chamber events for a second. So we are bringing back Get Movie Middleton virtually. Um, we'll be doing that on uh, Thursday, June 4th. Uh, we're also going to be doing uh, our on track, our next on track session is about how to make money on social media, primarily using LinkedIn, and that will be on June 11th. And we've introduced this new um, uh, program called FaceTime. So a lot of you are familiar with what FaceTime means at Get Movie Middleton. In this wor virtual world that we're living in now, it's, it's really about uh, facilitating authentic connections electronically. So it's our way to provide a networking opportunity to our members. So if you are interested in that, that is coming up on June 16th. Let me just check. Uh, Joe, it looks like I did get another couple of questions if you're still Sure, you bet. Available. Um, were you suggesting that everyone get tested even without symptoms or working at a high risk frontline job? Ideally, I think everyone should go get tested because one of the things that we know is that some people are asymptomatic and some people are, and a lot of people are certainly asymptomatic before they show any symptoms, but they're still able to spread the virus. Um, so one of the challenges is identifying folks before they know, because you know you might be feeling okay, and you might be you know interacting with people and spreading the virus. So, um, so, so there's that. And then also, if you're asymptomatic and get tested, that's part of the, we want the biggest number possible when we're looking at our sample size, so that we can get a true idea of the prevalence of COVID in the community. So yeah, absolutely. Even if you're asymptomatic um, or non-symptomatic, I would encourage folks to go down and, and get a test. And where should we look to see which phase Dane County is in in order to keep updated on that? Public Health Madison Dane County has a great website. Um, you know, certainly as we move from phase to phase or phase to phase, we will continue to do, you know, media and outreach. But um, Public Health Madison Dane County's webpage has a lot of good information on it. So I, I think monitoring that. They also have a really um, nice dashboard um, for cases if you haven't seen that yet. It's a daily count. It's updated about 9.30 um, every morning, and it shows you the increases in cases um, night to night, day to day, every 24-hour period. Uh, there's a graph on there, and then there are tabs that also show you like cases and positives by age, ethnicity, etc. Um, it, it's a lot of good information on their dashboard, too. So if you haven't visited their page, you might want to take a look. Perfect. Sure we, uh, Kristen, can you um, let everybody know uh, how, if they want to um, share this video with any of their colleagues, where they can find it? Absolutely. So we are recording this session. So after today, I will upload it onto the Chamber's YouTube page. And then everyone that attended will get an email with the link that you can then share with anyone that you think would find value in watching this. I have a quick question at the end here. Sure. <clears throat> um, Joe, this is Ryan Richards with Race Day Events. We're a local event company in, in Fitchburg. Um, right. Also the race director for uh, a couple of Ironman races. And um, just looking at, at the numbers and, and, the, and the phases, which, which I think is very clearly spelled out, but that final phase of having to wait um, until there's you know, a vaccine or something is, is limiting um, you know, a lot of event spaces, a lot of tourism, a lot of uh, trade shows, um, sports events, athletic events. What What is the thought or the discussion on that? Um, obviously, that negatively impacts the, the university um, as well for football, hockey, basketball, things like that, if this if this goes on into the winter. What, um, what kind of discussions, concerns um, have come of that? So, you know, we want to be as open as possible that it's safe to be open. And, and unfortunately, you know, we're not gonna get to that place where it's okay to, to pack a stadium again, really until we have a vaccine. Um, and that's, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to have to say that. It, it, it's a hard reality to face, um, but you know, the, this virus will continue to be out there until we have a cure or until we have a vaccine. So it's going to be a long time before we're back to kind of the normal that, that we experienced a few months back. 
Um, but you're right, it's always a balance, you know, we, we, you know, because people need to survive economically too. Um, so there are a lot of hard choices that have to be made. But, you know, I, I realistically don't think we're going to be back to full normal until we have a vaccine that's available, unfortunately. All right. Joe, this is Rick Hurst with Asbury Church. I'm, Hi, I'm wondering if you've made, the county's made any special considerations for opening houses of worship or any recommendations. Yeah, they're um, right now in, in the, the, the current phase that we're in, and I don't want to misspeak, I, I apologize, there's so much to keep track of. I believe the, the preparation stage that we're in, I believe that, that, that religious organizations can have you know, up to 25% right now. I would double check on that link, but I believe they were, um, churches could, could open um, to, to that percentage. And then you'd have to look at the phases um, to see um, how, how that moves up. With that. And, and again, that's under certain conditions with social distancing and availability of personal protection and sanitization, et cetera. Okay, does anyone have any final questions? Uh, I don't have a question, but I just have a comment for those who are still on this call. Um, you know, we're not the experts in, in um, uh any one uh topic but you know we develop our programming and um these these events based on members concerns and members feedback so um you know if you are struggling with um any aspect of um the situation at hand or any other business challenges that are unrelated to COVID, i just encourage you to reach out to us um so that you know we can help provide value um, in our programming with content um, that will be beneficial to you. So um, please continue to reach out, give us um, a call in my signature block. Um, I have my cell phone, my email address is kate at middletonchamber.com. Um, and so, you know, we're here to provide you with, with content that will provide value. So just keep us up on, on what you need from us. All right, everyone, thank you again um, for joining us today. A big thank you to, to Joe for joining and sharing everything that you know so far and for the work that you're doing for, for our county. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. thanks Joe.